I'm curious, uh, how many of you like to travel? Raise your hand if you like to travel. Yeah, a good number of you. I, I like to travel as well. One of the things that I've found out, and one of the things that Carrie and I like doing and have done uh, several times is going to cities and traveling. Uh, I like to travel in that way, but one of the things that I found out is I like to travel is that I don't like traveling. I like travel, but not, not traveling. There have been lots of times, in fact, last year we were um, going on, we went up to Kentucky for Thanksgiving. We were coming home and we got stuck in traffic and it kind of detoured us for about two or three hours. And I don't know if it's literally possible for your head to explode. I don't, I don't think it is, but I think in those moments when I get detoured like that, I feel like my head is going to explode. I like traveling. And when I'm traveling, I like doing it as fast as I possibly can, of course, uh, you know, within the legal limits, of course. But, but I like to travel just as fast as I can. In fact, when we do go back to Kentucky, we, we have this kind of this time where we have set where we're like, let, let's see if we can beat that. You know, every, every time we travel, like new record, you know, all right, high five. Or if it hadn't been for that traffic, we would have set the record. Or, it, when we travel, I say to the kids, make sure you go to the bathroom. And they're like, Dad, you know, we're teenagers. We know what to do and how to do it. But we're not going to stop. Make sure we, you know, I want to make sure that our travel is as quick as possible. How many of you are like me when you put something in the GPS and it has that, that ETA, like ETA 1 p.m., you know, you try to beat that, right? You, you know, you want it to be... And every time the number goes down, like 1259, you're like, oh, yeah. And, you know, you keep going. And most of us are like that, I think. We like, we like getting there. And most people want to get there. We want, to, we want the journey to go as well as, as we possibly can and, and, and be as fast as it possibly can. Well, today we're in chapter 6 of the story, as you can see uh, on our pictures here. Chapter 6 is here. Chapter 5 we've got painted. And, and chapter 6 is about that. It's about traveling. It's about a journey. It's about wandering. And as we've gone through the story, we found out that God's purpose for writing this story was to be with his people. God desires to be with us. And God's upper story is about that. How, all of God's ways to, to try to be with us and to get with us. And our lower stories, the stories that we've looked at, the story that we'll look at today talking about wandering, and our stories too, all, all tie together to try to um, get us to be with God as God works his upper story to be with us, our stories are tied together so that we can uh, in, in make as many people as possible a part of God's family. And so we're going to continue this week looking at chapter 6, uh, talking about this idea. Now, imagine a trip. Last year, my trip, I told you my trip home back here from uh, Kentucky on Thanksgiving added about two or three hours to our trip because there was a, I think it was an accident if I remember correctly, it was, and traffic got backed up and we were, you know, added two or three hours to our trip and it kind of messed everything up, made, you know, made me have a bad day, and I was all uh, frustrated. And I, I was listening to a football game on the radio, so that kind of made it a little bit better. But, but imagine a, a trip being delayed, not for two or three hours, or two or three days. I mean, I've, you, maybe if you've traveled out west by car, you've been in a trip that has maybe been delayed for a couple of days. I mean, that would be bad. Or if you've been in an airport stuck, you know, in an air, if planes aren't leaving and snowing or something, and you're stuck at the airport for a couple of days. Imagine a trip that's not delayed two or three hours or two or three days, but 40 years. Now that will make your head explode, right? And this is what we're going to be talking about this morning. We need to remember as we think about trips and as we think about uh, moving and doing and being, and as we think about our lower story, what we need to remember is this. The trip matters. The trip matters to God. Now, I, struggle, I struggle with this, and, and as I'm listening to or your response, probably a lot of you struggle with this as well, but to God, the trip matters. Now, as I've gotten older, I've mellowed a little bit, a little bit, right? And, but most of us have grandparents or have, have had grandparents, and we've heard them say things like, slow down, enjoy the ride, or enjoy the journey, enjoy the time, enjoy what's happening. I remember daydreaming when I was 14 or 15 years old. I could not wait to get my driver's license. And, and I kind of thought like if, when I was 14, 15, if I can only get to that point where I can get my driver's license, then, then the world's going to be great, you know? And then I remember as a junior or senior in high school thinking, I can't wait until I can graduate from high school. And, and I'm kind of over this. and I'm kind of my own man now, you know? And then I remember thinking after that, I can't wait. So I get my job or my career or start on my own path and I kind of am doing my own thing. It's kind of, I can't wait till this next step and I'm constantly looking toward the next step. And every time I would say these things to my mom and dad out loud, they would say, you just need to slow down. 
You need to think about what you're doing. You're wishing your life away. How many, how many of you have had parents that say you're wishing your life away? Yeah, a lot of us. I, my mom and dad used to say that to me all the time. And I think a lot of us, we, we realize that what happens, especially as we get older, what happens is we're, we're going on this journey and we're trying to get there as fast as we possibly can when all the while the trip matters. And God tells us the same thing. You see, God is more concerned about who we're becoming than where we're going. God is more concerned about who we are becoming on this journey than where we're going. Now, I, w- I want you to take a kind of a mental road trip with me. Imagine that you're, that you're uh, in charge of a trip and, and you're going and there's 20 or 25 kids. You're in charge of this trip, right? And, and you're the bus driver and you're the navigator and you're the one that's in charge. And all you have to do is make sure that these 20 or 25 kids get to their destination. Now, Picture yourself driving the bus with those kids in the back. What would that sound like? Now, imagine if you're, especially if they're maybe middle school kids, what would that smell like? Right? And, and if you're kind of picturing that in your head, you know why I don't do youth ministry because of that right there. Right? Now, imagine that, right? I mean, imagine being in charge of 20 or 25 kids and how hard that trip would be. Now, don't think about it in terms of 20 or 25 kids. Think about Moses. Moses was in charge of leading these people from slavery in Egypt to the promised land. And some estimates have the the population from as many as two or three million people. And Moses is leading them. And all the while, they're probably in the back saying, how much longer? When are we going to get there? What's going on? He's taking them from slavery to a land with milk and honey. And I imagine, I don't know that he said this, but I just kind of imagine Moses saying, okay, somebody time me, ready, go. We're going to break the record from Egypt to the promised land. And what they didn't realize, and what we too often forget, is that God is more concerned about who we're becoming than where we're going. And finally, they were camped at Mount Sinai. We talked about this a little bit last week as we talked about the Ten Commandments. They were camped at the base of Mount Sinai for about a year. And then finally, one night, somebody comes to the camp and they say, hey, tomorrow morning we're leaving and it's time to leave. And they had to be excited. They had to be thrilled. Now that it's time to leave, we're going on this journey. We're about to go. And Moses is hoping we can set a record and and they're ready to go, right? It's got to be exciting. I know I would be excited. And I didn't realize or didn't remember that God is more concerned about who we're becoming than where we're going. If you have your Bibles... Go ahead and open them up to Numbers chapter 10. Numbers chapter 10. Numbers, for those of you maybe who don't read your Bible a lot, Numbers is at the very beginning, towards the very beginning of your Bible. We're just in chapter 6 of our story journey here. Uh, For those of you who don't have storybooks, there are still some out there on the table. Um, We're going to be on page, or Numbers chapter 10. Uh, But if you're looking in your storybook, it's going to be on page 71 of your storybook. And like I was saying, if you don't have your uh, storybook or would like to have one for a friend or family. There's still some out there. When we run out of those, we'll order some more. So don't let that hold you up. Numbers chapter 10, and I'm going to be reading verses 11 through 13. On the 20th day of the second month of the second year, the cloud lifted from above the tabernacle of the covenant of the covenant law. Then the Israelites set out from the desert of Sinai and traveled from place to place until the cloud came to rest in the desert of Paran. They set out for the, this first time at the Lord's command through Moses. So here we have this group of people, two or three million people, and Moses is leading them from where they were to where they're going, and they have to be excited, right? They're so super pumped. But it didn't take long for their excitement to change. It didn't take long for their excitement to start to waver and, and begin to turn to whining. Look at Numbers chapter 11, starting in verse 1. It's on page 72 of your storybook. Numbers chapter 11, verse 1. Now, the people complained about their hardships in the hearing of the Lord. And when he heard them, his anger was aroused. Then the fire from the Lord burned among them and consumed some of the outskirts of the camp. When the people cried out to Moses, he prayed to the Lord and the fire died down. So that place was called Tiberah because the fire of the Lord had burned among them. The rabble, that's a funny word, right? I, I like that word. The rabble with them began to crave other food. And again, the Israelites started wailing and said, if only we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt at no cost. Also the cucumbers, melons, leeks, onions, and garlic. But now 
we have lost our appetite. We never see anything but this manna. And so for the briefest of moments, they're excited about their journey. And then they go on this journey and they start to complain and they start to grumble and they start to realize that we're eating the same manna every single day over and over and over again. And they start to think to themselves, if only we had some meat. I mean, this manna's fine, right? I mean, it's kind of, we make bread out of it and cakes. and what, what, It's fine, but, but what if we had some meat? And I, I think I would have probably been among the ones complaining. I, I want meat, right? I, I want some meat. God, what is going on? What, can't we just have some meat? And they wailing and complaining. And, and we kind of skip past this usually when we think about this or when we read it. But, but, but pay attention to what they're saying about their time in Egypt. Let me read that for you again. Uh, start in the verse 4. They say, if only we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt at no cost. Also the cucumbers, melons, leeks, onions, and garlic. And so they're looking back at their time on Egypt like it's some kind of, like, like they had some kind of party, right? Remember, they were slaves in Egypt. But they're looking back just a year before and they're saying, hey, you guys remember? Man, those cucumbers were good, right? And we had meat. Those were the best of times. Hey, you guys, that was great. I wish that we could do that. I wish we could go back. To that, it's almost like they're remembering their, their Royal Caribbean Mediterranean cruise or something, right? You know, they, and they pull out of their wallet like, hey, let me show you pictures back of the food we used to eat in Egypt. Imagine their, their Facebook pages would be, would be filled with uh, all of the good stuff of Egypt. Here the cucumbers. Yeah, here's where we were getting beaten, but don't pay attention to that. Here's what, look at this meat that we had. It was, it was just wonderful the way things used to be. You know anybody like that? Tell stories like that? Everything that used to happen was great. And they look back on their lives and they say, hey, let me tell you about when the best of times of my life was. Hey, let me tell you about all of this great stuff that used to happen. And they call it the good old days. Maybe some of you talk about the good old days. Remember back in the good old days. And they'll say things like, remember back in the good old days, we used to, to gather around in the living room, around the radio, because we didn't have TVs, and we'd listen to a radio show. And then they'd say, you know, remember the good old days. We didn't have a car. We had one car, and you know, we didn't get to drive it very much. And so we walked everywhere. It was the good old days. Or they'll say, yeah, the one car that we did have occasionally, we'd take road trips, and they didn't have air conditioning. And the seatbelts made noise, so Dad took them out. And, and there was a, you know, one of us kids would lay in the back the whole trip, you know. That was the good old days. And I, I hear those stories like that, and I'm thinking, I don't know what you're talking about. Those don't sound very good to me. I think most of us do that, right? I know I do. As I was thinking about this this week, I started thinking about some things from my childhood that, that brought me some good memories. And I remember when I was about uh, 13 or 14, something like that, my brother, who's three years younger, got a Nintendo for Christmas. Not like they have now, but like the original Nintendo Entertainment System. And if you remember what I'm talking about, you know this was great. You, you would put those cartridges in there, and sometimes they wouldn't work, and you'd have to blow those things out to get them to work, right? Those of you who had Nintendo, you remember. Those are good old days. Those are good old days. And, and I remember um, my favorite Nintendo video game, I've mentioned this before, was, was Tecmo Football. And, and Bo Jackson was unstoppable on that game. And if you were to pull it up on a screen of, among some, some kids now, they would be like, what in the world is that? Was it, that created during the time of dinosaurs or what? Because the graphics were terrible. But for the time, it was great. And I remember that like it was the good old days, you know? And we do that. We glorify the past. We think about the way things used to be. And we think about how wonderful those things were. And they wanted to go back. They wanted to go back to slavery in Egypt because they had better food. They wanted their trip to be easier. They, I think that they would be fine with the trip as long as the trip weren't so difficult. As long as the trip were more comfortable. As long as they didn't have to walk so far, you know, and it wasn't so hot. And as long as they had good food, I think that they would have been fine with the trip. And this is a warning for us. It's something that I want you to think about this morning. Comfort often stands in direct opposition to God's will. Comfort in our lives, when we look for the comfortable, when we look for the easy, those things often, not always of course, but those things often stand in direct opposition to God's will for your life. And what they didn't know and what we forget is that God is more concerned about who we are becoming 
than where we're going. One of my favorite professors at Louisville Bible College was a, was a man by the name of Chuck Lee. Dr. Lee uh, taught the Pentateuch, one of the several classes I had with him, but one of them was the Pentateuch, which is the first five books of the Bible. And he talked about this. And, and as he talked about this, he told us a story about uh, taking a group of adults to, the, um, to this area of the world where they, where they kind of went on a bus tour from Egypt and kind of traced where they think maybe the Israelites would have wandered and taken this trip. Excuse me. And, and as he was on this trip and on their bus, the air conditioning went out. And so they're on this bus in the middle of the desert and it's hot and people are sweating and it's getting rough. And he said, you should have heard it. And it's just, it, it's funny now as I, I remember Dr. Lee telling this story, he thought it was hilarious looking back because all of a sudden it kind of started in one little section. There was some little rumbling and they, there was the, the rabble as we kind of read about here in the NIV. There was this little rabble and they start making this little rumblings and then before long it spreads throughout the whole bus and they're saying, it's hot. When are we going to get there? How much longer? Can't they fix this air conditioning? And he said it reminded him, it made him think about, just imagine what it would have been like to actually be walking with the Israelites. They weren't walking. They were riding a bus that didn't have AC. And here they were whining. You know, unfortunately, sometimes we pray and God gives us what we want. Unfortunately, sometimes God gives us what we want. They wanted meat. Look at Numbers chapter 11, starting in verse 18. God was telling this to Moses. He said, tell the people, consecrate yourselves in preparation for tomorrow when you will eat meat. And I imagine when they first heard that, those, that sentence came out of Moses' voice. They were like, all right, high five. I've been looking forward to this meat. And the Lord heard you when you wailed. If only we had meat to eat, we were better off in Egypt. Now the Lord will give you meat and you will eat it. You will not eat it for just one day or two days or five or ten or twenty, but for a whole month until it comes out of your nostrils and you loathe it because you have rejected the Lord who is among you and have wailed before him saying, why did we ever leave Egypt? Unfortunately, sometimes God gives us what we want. And when we read that, we think, well, what's God doing there? Why would God do that? Why, I mean, isn't this kind of cruel? I mean, why would God do something that was so hard, so harsh. I think God does this to them because God hates complaining. I, th I think truly that God hates complaining. Con complaining is in direct conflict to a couple of the fruits of the Spirit, which is peace and joy. It's not wrong to complain to God. In fact, God encourages that. If you have issues, if you have struggles, I think if the Israelites would have would have individually or as a gathering said, Moses, can you take this prayer to God? This is hard. We're struggling with manna. God, we know that you can provide all things. Is it possible to get some meat on occasion? I think complaining to God is, is fine and, and encouraged by God, but it's wrong to complain to others, and it's certainly wrong to complain about God. Complaining shows a lack of trust in God. Complaining is like looking at God's face and saying, you don't know what you're talking about. Or you don't know what you're doing. Or you're doing it wrong. And most of us would never say that out loud, right? Most of us would never say, God's not doing this right. But when we complain about what God is doing, we're doing exactly that. And not only that, as we think about this rabble that kind of spread, not only that, but complaining spreads rapidly. It's kind of like, kind of like a virus. Complaining creates complainers. And most of you have seen this, right? Either at work, you know, you got this, this little group over there, and you may call them that, you know, um, you know whatever, your accounting or whatever. Uh, accounting, man, they're a bunch of complainers. I, I try not to go around them because they're negative. They're complaining, and before long, you know complaining happens. Or maybe at school, where you're around people who are constantly complaining. Or, or maybe in a particular family, you know. This whole family is negative as can be, and nothing but complainers. And God hates complaining because it shows a lack of trust and not only does it show a lack of trust, but, it, but God hates it also because people are a direct reflection of who or what they worship. People are a direct reflection of who or what they worship. When we complain, it looks as if, or we're certainly at least not, reflecting the God that we worship. People were looking at Israel. And people are looking at us as well. And when you complain, you're not reflecting 
the God that you worship. Remember, as we take this journey and as we go on this mission for God, remember, God is not as concerned about where we're going as who we're becoming. God is always going to be concerned about who we're becoming more than where we're going. And so they got close enough to the promised land as they're kind of on this journey. And, and they send some spies in, right? And, and all of a the sudden, the spies go in and they come back out. And all of a the sudden, these Israelites come down with grasshopper syndrome. I don't know how many of you have heard of this condition. It's pretty serious. It actually sounds like a pretty rare condition. Maybe you've not heard of it, grasshopper syndrome. But it's, but it's actually very common. In fact, most of us have had this syndrome at one time or another. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and flip them over to Numbers chapter 13. Numbers 13, 26 through 33 is what I'm going to be reading. If, if you're reading in the storybook, it's page 75. Numbers chapter 13, starting in verse 26. This was after they came back from spying. They came back to Moses and Aaron, and then the whole Israelite community at Kadesh in the desert of Paran. There they reported to them and the whole assembly and showed them fruit of the land. They gave Moses this account. We went into the land which you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey. Here's the fruit. But the people who live there are powerful, and the cities are fortified and very large. We even saw descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites live in the Negev, the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites live in the hill country, and the Canaanites live near the sea along the Jordan. Then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, We should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. But the men who had gone up with him said, We cannot attack those people. They are stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land which they had explored. They said, The land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw there are of great size. We saw the Nephilim there. The descendants of Anak come from the Nephilim. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we looked the same to them. Fear engulfed them. As they were about to go into the promised land, they, they had this journey, and they, they were right there, this thing that God promised them. They were, they were right there on the verge of going, and they got too afraid. Fear consumed them, and they seemed like grasshoppers in their own eyes. Now think about this. Uh, just a year prior, God had shown His power in Egypt. Uh, defeating the Israel, defeating the Egyptians and all of these plagues, causing them to leave Egypt. And now, they weren't willing to follow God into the promised land. I don't know how many of you are like me, but there's been several times in my life where I contracted grasshopper syndrome. Where I looked at what was before me, and I said to God, God, I can't do it. Or maybe, probably more often, I said, there's no way not to God, but to myself. I can't do that. I'm not smart enough. I'm not big enough. I'm not, I'm not good enough. I can't do that. I can't talk to people about Jesus. Who am I? I'm just one person. What, what can I do to change? And when you get grasshopper syndrome, what you need to remember and what they should have remembered is that there's nothing that's too big for God. Now, you may look at your life and you may say, I'm little. And let me tell you, you're right. You are little. We're little. I mean, well, look, at, look at the universe. The earth is little. And we're little in comparison to that. We are little, but with God, we are big. And we can do all things as long as He's with us and we're chasing after Him. And sure, our life can be scary when we do these things. Sure, that's not the comfortable way. That's not the easy way. But following God is where we're supposed to go. Remember, our life is not about being safe. It's not about just crossing the finish line and avoiding the struggles. It's about following God and going where He would have us to go. Our life is about the journey. And remember, God is more concerned about who we're becoming than where we're going. We need to remember, too, that there are consequences for sin. Caleb and Joshua wanted to go in, and the other ten spies said, no way, we're not going in, we're not going to do that, we're going to go our own way. And so the rest of the people said, we agree with those ten. Caleb and Joshua, we, we don't agree with you, we agree with the other ten, and we're not going to go into the promised land. Look at Numbers chapter 14, starting in verse 20. Numbers chapter 14, starting in verse 20. The Lord replied, 
I have forgiven them as you ask. Nevertheless, as surely as I live and as surely as the glory of the Lord fills the whole earth, not one of those who saw the glory and the signs I performed in Egypt and in the wilderness, but who disobeyed me and tested me ten times, not one of them will ever see the land I promised on oath to their ancestors. No one who has treated me with contempt will ever see it. And so God is saying, look, these people who rejected me didn't trust in me. These people who said, I'm not going because I don't trust in you, God. They didn't say those words, but sure, by their lives, that's how they were living. God says, they will not go in. Look, skip down to verse 30. Not one of you will enter the land I swore with uplifted hand to make your home, except Caleb, son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, son of Nun. As for your children that you, that you said would be taken as plunder, I will bring them in to enjoy the land that you have rejected. But as for you, your bodies will fall in this wilderness. Only Caleb and Joshua trusted enough in God to follow God, to say, let's go after him. Let's not worry about our comfort. Let's not worry about our ease. Let's instead follow God. And because of that, God was faithful to them. In fact, even Moses, as we saw in the video, even Moses didn't get to go into the promised land. Only those who were younger, other than Joshua and Caleb, those who were younger. And so my question as we wrap this up, chapter 6, is what about you? What about you? I mean, I, I know life is hard. I know that you, many of you, have bumps and bruises and scars right now because life beats you up. This journey is hard. And for so many of us, we, we want to get at the beginning and we want to race as fast as we can to get to the end as fast as we can. But remember, God is more concerned about who we're becoming than where we're going. And so what I want all of you to think about and all of us to do is to remember to, that we need to start becoming who God wants us to become. And then, when we're becoming who God wants us to become, then we follow Him and go where He would have us to go. And it's not through our righteousness that, 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 that God invites us on this journey. It's not through our righteousness that, well, that one day God would invite us into His kingdom. It's through the righteousness of Christ. I want to wrap up uh, by skipping ahead to Deuteronomy chapter 9. It's on page 86 of your storybook. Deuteronomy chapter 9, verses 4 through 6. Again, they were about to enter the promised land after this 40 years of wandering. Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 4 says this, After the Lord your God, this is Moses, After the Lord your God has driven them out before you, do not say to yourself, The Lord has brought me here to take possession of this land because of my righteousness. No, Moses says. It's on account of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord is going to drive them out before you. It is not because of your righteousness or your integrity that you're going to take possession of their land. But on account of the wickedness of these nations, the Lord your God will drive them out before you to accomplish what he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Understand then that it is not because of your righteousness that the Lord your God is giving you this good land to possess for you or a stiff-necked people. And you know, God could say the same to so many of us. In fact, God could say the same thing to all of us. It's not because of our righteousness. It's not because of our goodness that we are able to enter the eternal promised land. It's because of the righteousness of Christ. You see, one day our journey here is going to come to an end. Everyone's does. One day our journey is going to come to an end and those who follow Jesus will find themselves at the threshold of eternity in the promised land looking over like Moses over the cliffs into that great promised land. And, and, and I would call you as Moses called them to, to not think of yourself I'm here because of my righteousness. I'm here because I'm a good person and God loved me more. No. No. It's only through the righteousness of Jesus that any of us get to be there. And so in a moment, I'm going to say a prayer and the praise team is going to come up and, and sing a song. But I want you to think about that. Well, what does that mean for you? What does it mean for you to, to, to be looking at your life in this journey? What do you need to do? Where do you need to go? What does that mean? What does it mean for you to be thinking about one day I'm going to come to that point where I'm looking over the promised land, the one that God has built for us that'll last for all eternity. 
Maybe some of you are followers of Jesus, but, but you're not really following, right? You, you're, you're just kind of looking for the, the path of least resistance. And you want your life to be easy and comfortable, so you kind of, though you're trusting Jesus and you kind of follow him, but you don't really because you, you want your life to be comfortable like the Israelites. Maybe there's some of you in here this morning who, who have never put your faith and trust in Jesus. You need your sins washed away. And the only way that can happen is through the blood of Christ. And if you're not a follower of Jesus and you want to be, then, then during this song, come forward. I want to tell you how to do that. So I'm going to pray, and then we'll stand and sing. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your upper story, for the lower stories of the Israelites, as we can kind of understand what it looks like and, and the struggles they had. And it's so easy Father, to step back and to look at them and say, they did it wrong. Why didn't they know what they were doing? But, but the truth is, God, we, we do the same. And so, Father, I pray that you would help us to remember that it's all about who we're becoming in you. Father, help us not to take the easy path, but to take the path that you've laid out for us. If there's anyone here who's not following Jesus, I pray that today would be the day they did. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.